Good morning, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeanette Pratt. I'm going to be hosting today's webinar, and I have Svetlana Mikic, who's an entomologist from DPIRD, joining us as our expert on Russian wheat aphid. Welcome, everyone. Um, good to see you all here. Okay, well, we might start with the presentation. Um, I'm presenting this as the technical expert for Russian wheat aphid for the department. Um, as you know, we've just finalising a incident on Russian wheat aphid where we've just looked at where it is in our state and how widespread it is. And the, one of the main reasons for this talk is to give you all an idea of how to identify Russian wheat aphid, where we have found it and what we'd like you all as an industry for us all to do going into the future. So first things first. As Okay, there we are, my slide's now working. All right, um, I will be going through the life cycle, um, identification thresholds that have been developed by SARDI and the crop damage and why we really need to be looking at IPM. Now, on the right hand side here, you can see these little white bits. Now, a lot of agronomists keep asking me what they are and just for everyone, they're just the cast skins of the aphid nymphs. So every time a nymph goes through a malt, it actually leaves a cast skin. So it's not actually a dead aphid, it's actually a cast skin. And most of the photos that we do have in this talk were actually taken from esperance. So we have only found Russian wheat aphid in the esperance port zone. It's been confirmed at 24 sites. By confirmed, it means that a photograph has been taken of the aphid and it's been identified by the taxonomists. The Russian wheat aphid is different to all other aphid species that we get in our cereals. It's different from the corn and the oat and we expect that anyone who works in agriculture should be able to identify it using a hand lens. And for those of you that do have poor eyesight, you really do need a mobile phone with a macro lens on it. It's really distinctive aphid. At the moment, you can see on the right hand side, these aphids have little black things, they're wing buds, and we do have aphids on the wing in Esperance. And we expect that from those 24 sites where we found the aphids, that we will get movement into other parts of our landscape. It's been variable as to how much damage these aphids can cause. The Russian wheat aphid is a poor vector for viruses, but it does inject a toxin into the plant. Um, it has a bacteria in its saliva, which causes the striping symptoms that we see in the plants and can cause poor plant vigor. The longer the aphids feed on the plants, the more of these damaged symptoms that you see. The amount of yield loss does depend on the numbers of aphids that are present in the crop. At the moment, all crops in Esperance had very low numbers. We're looking at less than 1%. Control has been undertaken at those sites simply because the majority of them have been very close to trial sites and we are in the middle of field day season. The Russian wheat aphid is being managed in the Eastern States and it has been managed through IPM. The Russian wheat aphid can be quite cryptic to see and can hide in leaves. So that's why it's really important that you look at chemical choice when controlling Russian wheat aphid because it's feeding damage does cause leaves to curl and the physical curling of the actual cereal can cause um, the aphid to be protected from any insecticides. Now, it's been found in Esperance in the purple patches, so pretty much from Condung up all the way to Salmon Gums and down to Kumambuljup. It's been found in mainly Illibo wheat, but it's also been found in barley and um, other wheat varieties whose name has gone out of my head at the moment. It's pretty widespread, but present at low levels. We have been looking throughout the state. So the grey is the areas where we've looked but not seen Russian wheat aphid. And we've looked at 198 sites totally and only found the Russian wheat aphid 
at 24. So we have looked from Northampton down to Esperance and across to Albany, mainly concentrating um, in the low to medium rainfall areas. And this is really where we expect that the Russian weed aphid may be more of a concern simply because in the higher rainfall areas, we do tend to use insecticidal seed dressings a lot more. Um, and that's one of the reasons it was first, the aphid in Esperance was first detected in wheat where we don't usually use the seed dressing. And it was on early sown wheat that was um, experiencing a bit of moisture stress as well. We expect that our landscape will be suitable for the Russian wheat aphid. It has a preference for grasses, mainly um, its crops that it prefers is barley and wheat, but it can, can, can survive on barley grass, brome grass, wild oats. And what we actually don't know is what endemic grasses we have in Western Australia that will assist this aphid to survive its life cycle. It will be spread on the wind. Um, we can't stop that. So we expect that there'll be movement outside of the um, cropped areas that we currently see it at. And we expect that uh, next season, if we have a green bridge over summer, we will expect this aphid to have an increased distribution. If we don't have a green bridge over summer, um, we expect that we will see less incidence of the aphid, but we do expect that as the aphids are on the wing in Esperance, that there will be movement out. Now, a lot of people have been doing a quite a few uh, searches on aphids and aphid life cycles. And one thing I just wanted to be clear with everybody is that in Australia, we don't have a sexual life cycle, it's asexual. So it is a winged female that pretty much lands on a suitable host, whether it's crop or a grass and gives birth to live young. As soon as that nymph is birthed, it already has babies being produced inside it. And also the babies that are in the embryo stage inside it are also producing babies. And this is one of the reasons that aphids can build up in numbers quite quickly. The Russian weed aphid is known to complete its life cycle as little as nine, in, in as little as nine days. And its optimum temperature range is about 15 to 21. Um, and with the research I've read it, from Saudi, it's about 19 degrees, where it is one of its uh, optimum temperatures. And really in our landscape, we get temperatures in winter from 15 to 21 degrees. So we can expect that it will survive quite happily during our winter time. We know that a hot, dry summer will decrease its numbers. It doesn't like the heat as much. However, we do have pockets of vegetation where we expect that this aphid will persist. So we expect that it's the southern ag regions where we do have the milder summers where we'll see the aphids persisting. Now, just a little bit of a recap for everybody about aphid biology, because we're really relying on you as the people that are out in the paddocks or that might be dealing with industry to be able to identify this aphid. Now, the at the back end of aphids, you have these little exhaust pipe things, they're called sifunculi, and that's important. I'll show you in a minute why. And at the back end, this little tail region is called the quarter. The other thing that you need to, when you're looking at an aphid, is you need to take note of colour and of the length of the antennae. Now, for those of you that are colour blind, I realise that colour is not a good indicator, but you do need to also look at the aphid shape. So the reason it's important is the Russian wheat aphid does not have any sifunculi. And it's very easy to see if you are using a hand lens or even a mobile phone with a macro lens, you can just take a photo and zoom right in and you can see whether the aphid has got sifunculi or not. It also has a bifurcated quarter, which basically means um, a double tail at the tail end. So you can see here there's two tails. That's not very obvious when you are looking at it in the field, you do need to pop it under a microscope to really see that. But it, the Russian wheat aphid has this elongated body. It has this the tail end, the quarter is quite pointy. It does have short antennae, um, shorter than the oat or the corn aphid. However, 
it's really the body shape and this light green colour that you do see that's the distinctive features and the lack of the funculi. The adult oat aphids are quite pear shaped. They do have longer antennae, but what they do have is the sifunculi and the rusty red patch on the bottom. They are quite different to the Russian wheat aphid, which is, you can just see how light green in colour it is. And again, it lacks the sifunculi. The other thing that the Russian wheat aphid has is these black eyes, distinctive black eyes, which we don't really see in our other two species. You can see here again, the black eyes on the Russian wheat aphid, the elongated body, the pointy bum, whereas the corn aphid is slightly more elongate. You can see that it's got the sifunculi here. And if you actually look around the edge of the sifunculi is a dark greeny patch. The corda isn't as pointed, and it does have quite dark coloured legs. And again, it doesn't have these bright black eyes. You can see again there that the black marks indicate that the Russian wheat aphid does not have any sifunculi. Why are we interested in the Russian wheat aphid? Um, apart from the fact that it's spread quite rapidly. In 2016, it was first detected in South Australia and uh, now it's 2020 and we have it in Western Australia. It, is a worldwide pest, um, having spread throughout the major growing, growing areas of the world. Uh, overseas, it has caused more damage than what it has been reported as causing from South Australia. But we don't actually know exactly what it's going to do in our landscape because we do have quite a lot of areas which are low to medium rainfall, where in the years that we get uh, a green bridge with barley or grown brass present throughout our landscape, we can expect that even if you are controlling the weeds in your paddocks, it's the roadsides and the verges where we can breed up high numbers of aphids and that's when we expect that we'll get movement in. The thresholds that um, have been adapted from overseas and being used in the eastern states is if you are finding 20% of seedlings up to growth stage 30 with aphids or 10% of the tillers from growth stage 30 with aphids to consider spraying. The symptoms that we see on the plant can be the result of feeding of 10 to 20 days. It's interesting in that the feeding damage caused by the Russian wheat aphid is at times quite subtle. So if it's present on the plant early, you do see this streaking and it's obvious purple, white, green streaking up and down the leaf. Um, the plants can be quite prostrate. In Esperance, we actually didn't see prostrate plants, but what we did see was uh, a flag leaf with striping that had curled and in some cases wheat like this one here on the right hand side, where we did have um, the awns just looking deformed and it looks like there may be some uh, grain loss in that head. And we did see some grain loss and it's been very rare in the Esperance region, um, really limited to single plants. The symptomatic damage in the paddock can be quite subtle. And we're asking that if you are looking in any cereal paddocks, especially any that have not had a seed dressing, to look for striping of the plant, uh, a flag leaf that's curled. So if the crop's not moisture stressed and you're seeing curled flag leaf, open it up and have a look. And if it's got striping, have a really, really good look. So you can see here on the right, on the left hand side, sorry, um, this very subtle striping of the flag leaf. The edges have a little bit of purpling. And here it's a little bit more pronounced, the purpling on the edge of a flag leaf. And what we did was we opened those up and only in one case did we actually find aphids present along the flag leaf. In most cases, the aphids were present between the base of the leaf and the stem. 
and in this case there's only three aphids on this whole plant that we actually found and the plant only had striping on the flag leaf and that's the only leaf we actually found the aphids on but what we're asking you to do is to look at all the leaves on a plant so pull up the plant and have a look at all the leaves have a look at the base and you're looking for an aphid with and you can see here that it's got these bright black eyes um, light green body shape and with a pointed tail we don't need samples to be able to identify the aphid we are asking you to take a good quality photograph and for that you do need a mobile phone with a uh, macro lens on it uh, there are some of the newer mobiles with a macro function which does work quite nicely the photo does need to be in focus and we can identify it from a very good photo what we are getting though is a lot of reports of Russian wheat aphid causing crop damage but on further inspection it actually hasn't been a Russian wheat aphid it's been the result of either um, a herbicide as in the case here you can see that uh, quite a lot of the crop has got um, streaking but on close and the awns have a deformity but on closer inspection it's actually been um, herbicide damage we've also had reports of russian wheat aphid that have been linked to not russian wheat aphid but to nutritional deficiencies in the crops so you can get streaking and other funny looking leaves from the result of not just Russian wheat aphid, but from herbicide and nutritional deficiency. So that's just also something to bear in mind. To date, we cannot identify if the crop has had Russian wheat aphid from the leaf damage. We do actually need to see the actual aphid to confirm that it is um, the, that the streaking is the result of Russian wheat aphid. We are right now at the stage where majority of uh, cereal crops are flowering and are not at risk from Russian wheat aphid. We are asking that if you do happen to be out and about in the paddocks anyway, please just have a look. Only in the crops, we're not asking you to look in the weeds because the grass weeds aren't very symptomatic and it's very difficult to see Russian wheat aphid in them. But if you do happen to be going into any cereal paddocks, please have a look at the edge of the paddock. We're looking for you to only walk in about 20 metres. If you can, look at at least 30 plants. But um, what we actually found was that it's just a good idea to look and just see for any purpling or streaking on the leaves as a good indicator. And if you don't find anything, please report it. If you do find something, please report it. And please report any aphids that you're finding. We are really going to be looking next year for if we have a green bridge to look at monitoring for aphids and Russian wheat aphid in our landscape. If you do need next year to spray for Russian wheat aphid because the aphids happen to be at thresholds, please be aware that the curling of the actual leaf does protect the Russian wheat aphid from insecticides and in the crops that we did look at in Esperance, out of the five that I inspected, only one um, did not have aphids still present in there. Um, the others all did. And really the saving grace will be our predators because our predators will be able to uh, clean up any aphids that do get left behind by a spray. And so consider using insecticides that are aphid specific and uh, Sardi along with Caesar have actually found that our parasitic wasps do do quite a good job on parasitizing Russian wheat aphid as well as that ladybird larvae, lacewings and hoverfly larvae all will predate on the Russian wheat aphid so that's good news that even though we've had an incursion of an aphid our predators that we have in our landscape will still feed on it. So please, uh, you can report your findings either using PestFax Reporter or My Pest Guide or even through the Padders system. Um, for those of you that are troglodytes and don't have access to mobile phones, just send me a text. I've had quite a few people doing that, saying where they've been and what they haven't found. And that is really important just so we can make sure that it's still only in the Esperance region and next year we'll be able to give industry an indication of where the aphid actually is so we can respond if we need to. Now, thank you all very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now.
and I'm sure there'll hopefully be questions and I'm sure that uh, I'll have lots of assistance from some of our panellists um, and attendees who know a bit more about Russian weed aphid than I might. Okay, Svet, so we do have a couple of questions. So um, one of them is, is the reason they have been found near trial sites simply because people visit there more often? Um, no, uh, the, first lo the first found locality of the Russian weed aphid wasn't at a trial site. Um, it was actually not near the trial site. It was found by the agronomist. Um, the reason they were sprayed is simply because they are near a trial site which will be visited more often and really we didn't want the perception of spread to be there. And I will say quite honestly, I am absolutely um, amazed at just how observant our agronomists are and those in the Esperance region, just how they picked up one in a hundred plants with a Russian wheat aphid. Um, it, the symptoms are so subtle and it really came down to the agronomist being in the right spot at the right time and just uh, finding it. Okay, and the next question is, will Russian wheat aphid co-inhabit with other aphid species? Yes, they will. So we expect that Russian wheat aphid will have the same distribution and occur in the same areas that the corn and wheat aphid do. Okay, thank you for that, Svet. It looks, oh, hang on, we've just had another question pop up. Is there a difference to Russian wheat aphid tolerance in our commercial wheat barley varieties? To date, and I did speak with um, one of the wheat breeders at the Esperance Field Day, um, none of the wheat varieties that we actually have are commercially available in Australia as tolerant to the Russian wheat aphid. And from what I've read, neither are the barley varieties. Okay, and where can we buy a packet of ladybirds? <laughs> also, do all our common sprays work on them? No resistance to in Russian wheat aphid to any of our insecticides. Um, and the only way to get your ladybirds to stick around is to really look at what you're spraying throughout the season. Um, and look, our synthetic pyrethroids are toxic to ladybirds, so the less times they get applied late season, the more that we're in the landscape. Um, and you'll see in your chat that Martin Van Helden has just said, we've had spray failures with alpha cyclomethrin. Ah, that's good to know. So Martin, can you confirm whether the spray failures are due to resistance to the alpha cyclomethrin or due to the aphids hiding in a um, leaf that's been curled around. So I'm just trying to... Make Martin unmuted? Yeah. Oh, that's good. No, okay, Martin, you can unmute yourself now. Thank you. Yeah, hello everybody. <laughs> um, in, in that specific case, it was quite a young crop that was sprayed. Normally it should have worked. Um, and actually it was the case in the very first paddock where Russian wheat aphid was detected that after two applications of alpha cypermethrin, the aphids were still alive. So um, we consider alpha cypermethrin as not being a very good choice against Russian wheat aphids. Thank you. And um, just for those of you who don't know, Martin Van Helden is a senior entomologist from the South Australian Research and Development Institute who has been researching Russian wheat aphid for how many years now? Uh, since 2016, so from the very start. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, well, I think that looks like all our questions have been answered. So thank you, Svets, for joining us. Thank you for your help as well, Martin. And um, just to let you know that we have recorded this webinar and we will send a link out to everyone and it will be available on our website as well. So it should be available in the next week. Okay, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you all.